This conference yes, I... will now be recorded. Sorry, never there mind. There we go. Just got it. Thanks. Um, so thank you everybody for joining us. Um, as you know, Coos County had their reopening application approved and uh, we've only gotten a few complaints so far this morning. So apparently things are going okay. And hoping to get an update from our state and city partners today and, and, and also our local economic development people. Um, so Senator Roblin, would you like to kick us off? Yeah, thanks for everybody being here and really thanks for setting up these meetings. Also a beautiful day for opening. Uh, unbelievable out there actually. So we'll see how that goes and we'll see how well people stay close to their homes or which ones decide the beach is the place to go today. So we'll have to wait and see how that goes. Um, it's been interesting. I was on calls this morning with Lincoln County um, and some others up in the far north counties um, and, and listening to their what's going on. And it seems to be all going reasonably well today. So um, with respect to the state, two things. One, as you probably heard, the governor gave a, an edict to all of her um, agencies that they had to cut 8.5% um, from their biennial budget. So that means since there's only a year left of the biennial budget, it's a 17% cut to current status. Uh, she only has one tool and that's a allotment cut, which means that across the board, everything has to be cut 17%. All of those agencies are posting that to their websites, what it looks like, and um, they are pretty horrific cuts across the state. Um, and as you know, most of uh, county and state is people. So you'll be looking at the kinds of impacts that that direct cut has. Because of that, um, the Senate and House um, Speaker and President called together all of the co-chairs of the Ways and Means subcommittee process. And we have been asked um, to go into the budgets that we are responsible for. I'm on transportation economic development. So we have a number of budgets there. And we are to look at the cuts that were proposed by the agencies that we're responsible for, and then try to see if we can fine tune those cuts to save the things of the most, what we think are the most important and to have a conversation with those agencies about how to go about doing that. One of the interesting ones in my area is veterans. And so um, we've been looking at what they're looking at cutting, but a lot across the board, we've got Business Oregon, all of those are in ours, um, OLCC, ODOT, um, a lot of the ones that we know and work with. Many of them do not have a lot of general funds, so it's not gonna be as big an effect on them, but lottery is way down, so that's gonna have an effect as well. So we will be doing that over the next couple of weeks with an assumption and a hope that the governor calls a special session in June. Um, one agency in particular, and I don't know how many people care about Dugami, but Dugami was only funded for the first half of the biennium, so they have no money as of July 1. Um, so we either have to get in in June and uh, allocate some money or figure out what's going to happen in those cases. Uh, the other issue that we're getting is finding out all of the 47 different streams of federal money that are coming in. How are they being spent by those agencies? So we know which agencies are, are taking the biggest hit by not having any resources coming to them. So we will try to readjust and look at those budgets over the next um, two to three weeks so that we can be ready if there is a special session to be called. Number two, and the most urgent one is today at one o'clock, uh, we have an emergency board meeting. Um, as you know, Washington and Idaho and many of the other states have already started dispersing the money from the CARES Act to uh, local, local governments and others. Uh, Oregon has not done that to this point, And the governor, I think, believes, and I think rightfully so, that the legislature has to have a part in that. So uh, we're having an e-board meeting today to do an allocation of the $1.36 billion that uh, the state has been given. Um, it's set up in uh, four little tranches, uh, 450 million for state expenses, 415 million for local governments and tribes, 300 million for new programs, which is unspecified and makes us a little nervous, and 225 million for reserves for a total of 1.39 billion dollars uh, is going to be allocated today um, for the use by those agencies um, to distribute. So with that comes a number of other pages of information and I would encourage all of you to go and look at that information. Uh, it's on OLIS under materials for today's e-board meeting and you can also watch the e-board meeting live from one to three. Um, 
There are three coastal representatives, so I think that's positive for us. Betsy Johnson, myself, and David Gomberg are all on the e-board, um, and we have a number of questions regarding how the distribution is going to happen and, and how do we make sure that not only is population a consideration, but also those of us that have been hit the hardest. And if you look at the coast, because tourism is such a big part and such, and because the, the money that comes in from the taxes on tourism actually funds some of our local governments completely. So Toledo uh, and a couple of these other smaller cities have no tax base. So their only tax base is the money they get from those taxes, which have been non-existent lately. So figuring out a budget for some of those is really important. And we have been having conversations with Oregon League of Cities that also um, looked at the criteria and felt that the federal treasury gives a little bit more discretion to cities than what our guidance is. And so we'll have questions about that to try to figure out what's going on and during the e-board meeting today. Um, the other thing is that three municipalities and or governments were given the money directly. Um, and that was because they had over 500,000 populations. So Washington, Multnomah and uh, Portland itself, the two counties uh, are, and, and, and the one were in that group. So they got uh, their money up front. Um, the difference is that their um, chief executive is responsible for how the money is spent. So if the federal government believes that when you send in your um, collection or how you spent the money, if you didn't do it in the way that they uh, prescribed for you, they will ask for the money back. Um, the governor is clearly the one that's on the hook for all of the state money. It came to the executive branch, how she spends it and how she um, gets the information back to the federal government, how it was spent is solely on us. So that's one of the reasons she's been a little leery about sending out the money because it needs to have the receipts. So there's a conversation going on of whether or not it should be a reimbursement only. You send in the receipts, we look it over to see if it was done. That's gonna be a conversation on today's issue as well. And I think that's a little harder for some of our coastal counties because they don't have the money in the first place to spend it and then get it reimbursed. So we're gonna have a conversation about all of those things on, on the e-board today um, and try to get some answers for you. And then the one that's the 300 for new, new programs, I'm, it, does not specify what those new programs are, and I think there'll be a, a number of questions about those as well. But at least at the end of today, I expect that a, no, a bunch of this money will be um, taken. It, it, it'll be given to the to the agencies to disperse or to spend. So um, some of it will be unscheduled, but most of it will be uh, scheduled to go out and. Um, when that's all said and done, we need to watch very carefully and make sure that the uh, areas that, from my perspective, I represent are well represented in the distribution of those funds. So we will continue to watch it going forward. Um, that's kind of the whole meeting for this eBird. It's only about those four items or three items. And there's a also a letter in the um, materials from the governor that explains part of the process and why um, the metro counties aren't getting much. There's a number of people who are very concerned rurally that Clackamas County, which is the next largest population county, is going to want all the money. So we're going to have to watch carefully to see how that distribution and what the formulas might be with respect to how it's going to be distributed. So that's an update on what's happening uh, at the state level. And congratulations Thank you. on reopening and all the stuff you guys have done. You've done a very good job and I, I hope that people in our community are really listening because I think the things that I've heard from John and from Melissa, from everybody about being responsible, um, recognize that people like me who are over that 65 and have underlying conditions um, are a little nervous about being around people coughing and um, even those that we don't know that but might have it. Well, I always wear a mask and I know that I'm marrying the mask for other people and that's the responsible thing to do and I hope that people out there who watch these and are listening are understanding that it's not about you. Um, you may be brave and think you're tough and you can go out there without a mask, but the issue is you are exposing others of your friends and neighbors if you don't take those precautions. And I, I really hope that people use that common sense that uh, Oregonians generally have and coastal people have to, to be kind to your neighbors and to recognize it's not about me, it's about the other person standing next to you in the line who is very nervous about being out there. And if we really want our communities to open up and people to visit hotels and 
hus and uh, restaurants and other kinds of things, they have to feel safe that they're going there. And and you make the difference, individual citizens, not all the things that the hostels and the, and the restaurants are doing. Um, so keep that patience in mind and recognize that you're helping each other um, by taking care of yourself and doing it right. So thank you for the time to talk. Thanks, Senator. I, I had a question yesterday about the governor's reluctance to pass the CARES Act funding through directly and then just audit us. I mean, that happens already on a lot of funding we get where the contract or the funding agreement says that, you know, we have to repay it if it's not spent correctly. Why wouldn't you just do a mechanism like that again? It's a good question, and I, I don't have an answer for that. I know that the uh, Ways and Means people have been talking a lot about the process, and we're going to find more about that today, but I do not know why that was not one of the considerations, because I, I think that can work, um, but I, I don't understand either. Okay, thank you. Really that's what's happening with Portland and those others. They're going to have to come up with their own auditing when the government asks, and so mm -hmm. there, there, there's obviously a mechanism for doing that. Thank you. Anybody else? Uh, this is on. Along that line, you know, it wouldn't have to be an all or, or nothing uh, thing in, in giving the, the local governments a, a, a lot of say in how these are, are, how that money would be used, even, even if some of what would go to each local entity uh, were able to be spent at their discretion within the guidelines uh, proposed, that, that could be very helpful. Okay. Thank you. I will bring those things up today. Thank you. Yeah, the issue is, and you already hit on it, Senator, that we don't have a lot of extra money laying around to put out and then wait for reimbursement. So yeah. you you know your district. <laughs> All right. Anyone else before we move on to Representative McEwen? Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Um, I don't have a lot. Arnie, Arnie's um, update was comprehensive. We are so fortunate to have Senator Roblin sitting in these really important positions. Um, he's been on a number of the um, advisory groups that the governor has put together. He's on the e-board. Um, he was on the COVID committee. So Arnie, thank you for your work. Um, but we're just really fortunate to have this very high level representation for us. And as Arnie said on the e-board today, we have um, Representative Gomberg and Senator Johnson in the Coastal Caucus. We'll have a meeting after the e-board today to kind of recoup, but um, we're very fortunate to have this representation at very high levels. So be grateful for that. Uh, and thank you to the county commissioners for the thoughtful way in which you have navigated this opening. This just seems to have people on all sides of the issue a bit riled. Um, hopefully things will settle down in two or three days. Uh, when people see that we can do this, it can be done thoughtfully and it can be done well. And I don't need to, 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 to harp on it uh, again because it's the message of the day. But the answer to us being successful is personal responsibility um, and people being reasonable about what their expectations are. Uh, and understanding that we do need to take care of each other here. So you've heard the message over and over and over. I don't need to say it again, but um, it's really important that people hear it from all of us as we move forward. Um, the question came up about state parks. If you go to the state parks website, they have an interactive map where you can just go click on uh, the, the local park and see what the status of that is. It's up to date or it was up to date as of, as of the 12th. Um, so uh, if anybody needs that, you can go take a look at it. That's what I understand that they are asking people to do right now. Um, I don't have a whole lot to add. Um, the, the committees that I sit on right now are economic development and transportation, of course, and we're putting agendas together for those committees for June meetings. Um, a lot of it is geared towards um, um, how we're going to address the budget, huge budget cuts that are going to be coming as uh, after the uh, the revenue forecast on May 20th. So we're all, all those kind of waiting with bated breath to see what happens on the 20th and then um, try and figure out how we're going to manage going forward. But it's going to be significant. People need to understand that and be prepared for it um, and not be surprised by it. That's about all I've got, Melissa, um, from here. Thanks. Thank you. Questions for Caddy? 
No, I do have one for you all. I'd like to pose before I, I um, go mute. Um, there was a conversation last week that Roger, I think you brought it up about proposing that um, the executive branch allow counties to have some discretion um, for specific institutions if the health department deems that they can um, manage uh, functioning safely, i.e. the pool, the theater, the bowling alley. Those are the ones that came up here, but there are others across the state. I know the question was posed to LOC and AOC. I'm just wondering if anybody has heard anything back. Uh, we pushed the question up to the, the governor staff level, but I haven't heard anything about uh, that getting um, people's kind of shoulders into it and pushing a little bit to allow bit, uh, some local control. Anybody have an update on that? If you do, I'd love to hear it. I uh, posed the question to my uh, colleague uh, earlier this morning to see if uh, it had got any traction. Uh, initially, he did tell me it, it had gone up past his work group uh, to the executive branch, but we're not hearing any word yet. And we also got Association of Oregon Count Counties involved, and um, and again, they're working on it, but I haven't heard a lot back yet either. Okay, well, we pushed from our side, so we'll maybe uh, raise it again. Thanks. Thank you very much. I think there's a, a series of, yeah, I mean, we see these, there's the little issues. Um, I think Roger's probably getting a lot of questions about the pool because I know I'm getting them. Questions about movie theaters. Um, a lot of people think it's pretty clear that we could obey social distancing out here in rural Oregon and keep people safe and still have those facilities open. But we need some flexibility if we're gonna do that. And then of course, I also got a question this morning of, you know, what are we going to do if restaurants aren't obeying the phase one opening guidelines? And what should people do if they want to report a restaurant for not obeying the phase one opening guidelines? So I gave them Eric Gleason's cell phone number, said anytime, night or day, call Eric. <laughs> and he just walked away. So I, <laughs> I told Bob. them, couldn't Bob? Yeah, couldn't Bob yeah. help on that? Yeah. Actually, the answer I gave, and I'd be curious if anybody um, thinks that there's a, a better answer, was that right now, um, I think our answer is that local police um, need to go out, or we would like it if they would go out and just educate the restaurant owner or business owner about, you know, what the regulations are and where they're going wrong. And then if they refuse to comply, then a report is forwarded to the DA. I think that's where we're at. I don't know if anybody has a different perspective on that than me, but I can't be the only one's going to get that question in the next week. Melissa, does where does OSHA come in? I, I, that question was posed to my office about is it the county health department, is it the local law enforcement, or is it OSHA? Who who gets the complaint? And I was not sure, so I was hoping to get an answer on this call. I think OSHA gets the complaint if it's an actual employee that complains. Is my understanding? Um, law enforcement gets a complaint if one of us forwards it along. Um, county public health can get involved, and, and Eric Gleason and I have had this conversation. They can potentially pull somebody's restaurant license, but if they're intentionally violating the phase one opening agreement, there's no guarantee that they're going to then comply when we pull their, their restaurant license. So then it gets into a so what situation. Um, and and we haven't quite figured out exactly what the so what, how far we're willing to go if somebody refuses to comply. Totally open to discussion. Um, and I have talked to other other counties about this and pretty much everybody's in agreement that um, we need the governor's office to give us a little more guidance mm -hmm. on this or at least some more enforcement capabilities because right now, if the DA cites you into court and he's been open about this, that's not gonna happen until July at the earliest. That's not exactly a meaningful and immediate punishment. I mean, it's like, yeah. If, if I tell somebody they're gonna suffer four months from now for what they're doing, they're not likely to, to comply right away, especially businesses that are already struggling and are, are wanting to make sure they can make their bills. Roger, did you have a comment? No, I was just gonna mention that's exactly um, how I've directed our personnel. We'll go out and try and educate. After that, we'll uh, report, and we were gonna cross report to OSHA and to the DA's office. Okay. Uh, and, and the DA has, 
And call Eric. I'll send you his cell phone number. Sometimes he's hard to reach in the middle of the night on a Saturday at like 2 a.m. or something. So you'll want his cell phone number. <laughs> I think I have it. <laughs> oh, good. We can put it can on the you. website, right? <laughs> there you go. Anybody else on this topic? I was hoping Commissioner Sweet would talk briefly about TARCs because that's also another big one we keep getting questions about. I'm sure you guys are hearing them too. You know, who's allowed at the dunes? When are the dunes going to be open? Um, that kind of thing. John, could you give a quick synopsis? I, I, can, I can talk about that. Uh, regarding the dunes, as you know, last week they opened the dunes, but the only act, the only, and I don't know what the rationale was behind this, only to uh, guests of Riley Ranch and of Douglas County's uh, RV park at Winchester Bay. Uh, about 35 minutes ago, I had a call from um, the U.S. Forest Service office in Walport, Oregon, and the lady uh, uh, said that they, at noon today, will open the gates to the dunes at Spin Reel, and at Hauser. None of their facilities will be open, but there will at least be access uh, to, to more people now. Um, so that's, that's what I know about the dunes. Uh, our own parks, uh, we had a very successful and quiet uh, opening uh, last weekend. Very few people uh, at our parks. Uh, particularly at Riley, uh, you know, virtually no one from our county uh, normally goes to Riley, uh, camps at Riley anyway. And as you know, uh, our restrictions last week were uh, county campers only. Um, we broadened the uh, number of counties we would serve uh, starting today uh, so that guests from and reservations from uh, Douglas County, Lane County, Josephine County, Jackson County, Curry County, and Coos County uh, would would be allowed. Uh, the idea being that we we try to restrict the uh, occupancy to the kind of the southwest quadrant of our state. We had some old reservations on the books from Washington and California, which uh, have been uh, of course, uh, canceled. Uh, everything else we talked about uh, at our parks, well, no, it's been, we did open the parks uh, to day use, uh, except at Riley where the day use uh, area is, is being occupied as a staging area for a, a, a new uh, RV uh, site that we're developing there. Uh, but we uh, conceded to have day use at Powers, Laverne, and um, uh, Horse, not Horse Fall. Uh, what's our beach? Uh, Asendorf? Asendorf. Asendorf, yes. And the reason for that largely was that uh, there were great pressures put on our staff at, uh, at uh, Laverne last week. Uh, it was a beautiful day. Uh, people wanted to come in and, and, and swim, and th there just wasn't any stopping them. And so uh, to avoid confrontation, uh, it, we're, we opened for day use uh, with a provision that if, if it's overwhelming, we'll, we'll pull back on that. Uh, are the bathrooms still closed, John? Pardon me? Are, are we will the bathrooms still closed? In the day use areas. Uh, for day use customers. And, and again, uh, we decided on that because we, we knew the alternative would be what uh, Arnie was just discussing before the meeting started, that uh, uh, people are going to go to the bathroom anyway. So you might as well. We put up signs uh, that said the, the uh, you know, sanitation isn't what we should have for this or, you know, for given the situation, but uh, so use at your own risk. Um, other than that, pretty much the same as we had last week. 
uh, reserva prepaid reservation only, so there's no uh, interchange between our, our staff and the guests when they come or when they leave. Uh, every other campsite maximum uh, used, so to provide for uh, uh, social distancing. Uh, some of our campsites are quite close together, so we thought that was a prudent thing to do. Uh, we're, we've made sure that our staff have adequate PPE. Uh, I think that about covers it. Great. Thanks. Has the, for, has, uh, the I'll be monitoring the campgrounds tomorrow and Sunday uh, to get a first-hand look at what's going on and, and uh, have a report uh, for the Board of Commissioners on Monday morning. Or mon yeah, Monday 11. Thanks. Have we talked about removing the barriers at Bassendorf yet? I mean, it's just created such a traffic headache. Oh, oh, Bassendorf, I'm sorry. Uh, I got word yesterday uh, from BLM that they're going to open that up on Monday. Sorry, we couldn't get that done more quickly. Okay. So we'll remove the barriers then? We'll remove the barriers, yes. Okay. I think probably people have been getting questions about that. Yeah, that's a valid question. And, uh, you know, last weekend we had a situation where a surfer was in distress uh, off Bassendorf Beach. Fortunately, uh, he made it in without any uh, any help. But uh, the, the question uh, was raised that uh, you know what would happen if an emergency vehicle were required to uh, go to Bassendorf and. Uh, uh, it would have been very difficult given the number of cars that were crowded along the uh, the one little area that's open to parking. And so that was reported to BLM and, and uh, they acted perhaps not as quickly as I would have liked, but nonetheless, they did act and come Monday morning, we'll be, we'll be okay. Great. Thanks. All right. I'm Quite just going to go across. Oh, go ahead. Questions for John? I'm just going to go across the screen like Hollywood Squares and ask for volunteers here. Joe, do you have anything? No? You're muted. No, I don't have anything. We just did our budget last night, and no. Okay. <laughs> Sam, anything from Coquille? Uh, sure. We opened our camping and RV. Uh, just self-contained only, uh, down in uh, Skirtlewind Park and our RV campground. Uh, the boat launches are have have been open for a couple of weeks, and we're seeing actually an increase of boats on the river over the last week or so. Um, I think that's about it. Great, Darius. Anything about the fair? Yes, absolutely. Uh, we had a, uh, a special board meeting last Monday night. Uh, we voted to uh, proceed with planning for the livestock show and auction uh, for the fair this year. We're still looking at some of the other aspects. And, you know, probably the reality is a large part of the traditional fair experience just won't be possible under the phase reopening. Um, but we're keeping our options open and keeping an eye on things. We are going to have our regular board meeting on Monday, so we'll probably have a more definitive announcement out for that. We'll we'll vote on that and then get it over to the commissioners to review, um, and then we'll publish it. Uh, I was on the OFA call last Friday, uh, sorry, yesterday, um, and the the situation for the fairs across the street state is pretty bleak. There were a handful of fairs that just, they they can't afford to do anything, and they're concerned about the possibility of even being able to do anything um, uh, the following year. Um, it's, it's looking pretty bad. 4-H and FFA are continuing to try to figure out how they can do, like, virtual shows and, and those kind of things. Uh, we have not, we're waiting for word back from them. Um, and then lastly, you know, again, funding, we're probably, the Coos County, our income is probably about 10% of what it was last year. Um, we're, 
our revenue that is and and so we're looking for opportunities i think it's going to be tough for us because a lot of ours is um money that's donated so you know the scenario where you have to to spend money and then put a receipt out um we're not spending a lot right now but uh we're not getting a lot in so i i'm not sure how some of like the cares act funding we how we would account for that um, for those of you that are on some of those committees, if you can please uh, remember to mention the fairs and, and their unique situations, we would certainly appreciate it. It was, um, it was a tough call yesterday for the OFA. Uh, that's all that I was. have. Thanks. All right, John Burns with the port. Yes, hi. Um, hi. Just, just so everyone knows, we are seeing a real increase of uh, traffic at the marina. Last, last weekend, the boat ramps saw a tremendous amount of fishermen taking advantage of that. We anticipate next weekend will be much greater because of the opening of all waters halibut. The RV park also saw an influx, a, a greater influx in the last two weekends since the short-term moratorium was lifted. And so we uh, we are doing everything we can to try and make sure that uh, we are keeping both our employees and the public as well protected, well protected as we can. But you know, people will be coming in. Uh, you know, I happened to be down there last Sunday, and caught a, a group of Corvette lovers having a having a big uh, party in the parking lot because there was nowhere else for them to go on the coast. So, um, you know, those, those challenges will continue to pop up. But otherwise, we continue to work. The, uh, the fishing fleet has been somewhat stymied. Uh, I know pink shrimp season has been still, they're still negotiating prices. So that's been a little bit. And, uh, Hopefully we can get back to, to normal uh, normal catches soon. Let's have a question for John. Yeah. Um, John, I think you've already answered it at once, but it might be nice for the group to hear. You were having an issue with PPE for your staff, um, and did you got that problem solved? Correct. We, we did, Caddy. We were able to uh, fortunately get our hands on some short-term okay. solutions. Uh, through the, the good, good good folks at uh, SOWIB, uh, we got some disposable masks, but also we just had offered up to us through MARAD uh, part of, they've got a 1.5 million cloth mask that they will make available. I just put in our application, so uh, we'll be able to tap into that. And also the Coast Guard has maps uh, mask available here in the state of Oregon that we can we can take uh, advantage of as well. Great, thanks for the update. Great. All right, Teresa, the CCD. Good morning. Um, yeah, morning. things are definitely, definitely busy. Um, taking advantage of some opportunities to bring some resources to our region. Of course, they all drop at the same time. So. We're just finishing up a proposal to the state of Oregon COVID-19 emergency business assisting matching fund. Um, so we're going to, our request to them is for 225,000 to match what we have already allocated towards that. CCD did a 200,000 directly. We've also received 20,000 from the city of Roseburg, 5,000. So that will be submitted Monday. We have also received invitations from EDA to apply for some additional funding to create a new revolving loan fund, as well as a technical assistance grant through a non-competitive process. Um, the revolving loan invitation is for $1.4 million and the technical assistance one is for 400,000. So we will be pursuing those. We have a 30 day window to complete that process. Um, we've funded about 140,000 directly through our micro lending COVID-19 emergency assistance program. We still have a four loans in progress. Um, we've got two in-house regular requests happening and seven in-house um, SBA pending closing deals. So we're busy on the on the lending side. 
I'm still really spending a lot of time with outreach, um, helping small businesses kind of tackle um, the issues at hand, uh, maybe do some planning and determine their timelines. So oh. we're busy, but things are good. That's it, unless you have any questions. Questions for Teresa? All right, Eric Gleason, Coos Health and Wellness. The man to call if you have complaints about any public health violation at all. Uh, I'll get you guys my number, but don't be surprised if in the middle of the night I sound a lot like John Sweet. <laughs> uh, we are uh, looking through all of the sector guidance right now to kind of come up with um, recommendations for people when they call. We're anticipating a significant amount of questions regarding um, the reopening process and what that means for for individual sectors so that's kind of i mean where we're at right now based on um, all the happenings of today but um, other than that we're just continuously uh, plugging along and trying to make the best decisions we can from a public health perspective for the county so we're always available for questions um, if you have any we might not have all of the answers right away but we uh, we can usually get them to you in a timely fashion Thank you. Questions? All right. If not, we're on to Terrence O'Connor, City of North Bend. Thank you, Melissa. Um, just to let you know, we did have officers go out to our friends at Cozy Kitchen on Sunday, spoke with the owner's wife. They, as you surmised earlier, said, go ahead and send your report to the DA. We don't really particularly care that much. Uh, we think we need to do the right thing and open up. And at least partially for their credit, they were complying with what are now the guidelines for, for opening up in a restaurant. Um, and of course, the DA said that's not exactly going to be one of his priorities. Um, so there's that. On the uh, recreation side, uh, but well, on the recreation side, uh, uh, we're getting people that believe that the do not cross yellow tape on playground equipment should be removed. So they're removing them even after we've told them that that's still not a wise idea, uh, unless of course they're going to wipe down every piece of equipment once their child uh, leaves the playground uh, equipment. So that will be a challenge, I, I guess, from our perspective, or from my perspective, not the government's perspective. Uh, you know, maybe that'll just deepen the gene pool uh, eventually. So um, with respect to other things, um, you know, as we start to open up, I think we're going to get more and more calls about, you know, what's appropriate, what's not appropriate. Um, and the general guidelines that that the state puts out are initially helpful, but then, as we all know, the devil's in the details. And nobody ever comes up with an exact question to fit the exact answer on the general guidelines, which is why I, I think Roger's suggestion from last week was was a great one, and that is, you know, because we all are different in all 36 counties and even within those counties, depending on the population size, it would seem reasonable to uh, delegate some of some of the opening authorities uh, back to more of a local level than at the state level. But yeah. Um, Let's see what else. Ah, yes. Um, Tuesday, you know, let's let's vote early and vote often, uh, particularly for uh, the appropriate ballot measures. Uh, certainly here in North Bend, anyway. Uh, if not, we'll have a uniquely different North Bend uh, come come July one. And that's it from here. Thanks, Terrence. Any questions for Terrence? All right, Sean Stevens. 
Okay. Um, good morning, everybody. It's still morning for a little while. Um, from Business Oregon, as Teresa said, uh, last Friday at five o'clock, and I don't know why we picked then, but we launched or announced the, the Small Business Emergency Matching Fund and, um, and CCD's fund that they stood up, uh, COVID fund is, is the only fund I'm aware of in the region that's, that's eligible for that. So uh, I'm glad to see that uh, they're getting that together and, and hopefully we'll be able to, to match those funds and, and get some grant dollars in the region. Um, there's also uh, $3.75 million of CDBG money. I think I've talked about that. Um, this is kind of a reallocation of, of our current allocation to the state. Um, that's been kind of on hold waiting for the governor's office to approve the NOFO. Um, from my understanding, that should happen soon and we should have some information that that's released um, possibly next week. Um, so, and we've talked about uh, two applications in, in the region, Coos and Curry would be one, and then Douglas and uh, the city of Roseburg would be another for uh, small business and or micro enterprise assistance um, dollars. Um, since Sean Gibbs isn't, doesn't look like he's on this call, um, I'll talk, uh, they've released a, a business survey. Uh, I think he, um, I think he had 50 plus respondents as of yesterday. Um, what what we're trying to attempt is uh, m much of this money that, that could be possibly coming uh, requires uh, has an employment size, and then that that they haven't received uh, the federal idle or PPP loans. Um, at the time of their application at least. So we're trying to identify those companies that that kind of fit in those categories. And um, Sean said of the respondents, it was about a 50-50 split. 50% uh, had received, have already received funding and 50% hadn't. So I, I think we're getting good response and, and, and have a good idea of, um, you know, who those candidate companies might be, uh, assuming we get the funds. Um, and then the last thing, uh, Senator Roblin mentioned, um, or I, I got two more things actually. Senator Roblin mentioned the budget cuts. Um, it doesn't necessarily affect uh, my region or Coos County, but um, we did have a vacant RDO position as part of those cuts. And when we submitted our proposal to LFO, they told us that position was essential and that we should hire it. So. We have already filled it. Uh, we were actually ready to fill it and then put that on pause. And um, uh, we'll probably announce that uh, next week, but that person will begin um, June 1st. And that's for the Southeastern counties um, in, in Oregon. Uh, and then uh, my truly last thing is uh, I've been, uh, partnering with uh, Alex Campbell at Regional Solutions, and we've hosted three webinars this week on reopening requirements uh, for retail restaurants and personal services. And then at uh, three o'clock today, uh, there's a, a fourth one on childcare, if anybody's interested. And uh, um, you can tell me if you want the information or, um, send me an email or put it in chat or something, I guess, um, and I can get you that information. I think that's Thanks. all I have, Commissioner. Thanks, and those are recorded, right? Because I've directed people they, back to watch them. They are. Um, I'll have and, to hunt down where they're posted, but <laughs> uh, but I can get that information, yeah. Great. And this is Senator Roman. I just want to say thanks to Sean. He's done a great job in the economic, the regional economic stuff, too, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, it's nice to have a webinar that we can direct people to. So, because I hate trying to interpret the regulations for them, um, you know, we don't have that regulatory authority, and we don't want to give people guidance that might turn out to be wrong. So, thank you very much. Thank you, Roger. 
Yeah, thank you, Sean, for those webinars. Uh, uh, anybody that wants the links to those, they're in this uh, week's uh, Friday update. Um, so that just got sent out today to all of our people and then on our Facebook. Uh, I think the council has a tough decision next week, although I, I think the decision, there isn't a decision to be made, but we'll probably have to cancel the fireworks uh, event for downtown Coos Bay. Uh, the Mill Casino's already canceled theirs. We already closed our event in the park. So, other than that, uh, was a late night last night. Uh, council uh, and the budget committee met and approved uh, next year's budget. Uh, which will be impacted uh, to some extent by COVID-19. That's all I have. Thanks. Jessica? I didn't have anything um, specific to add, although North... Uh, City of North Bend will be having their budget meeting next Tuesday, so if you're interested, you can find the link on our webpage and join from 7 to 10 p.m. and learn all about our budget. That's all I had. Great. Do you guys live stream that if people want to watch? Yes. Terrific. I'll put it on my council page, the link, and it's also on the city page, too. All right. Thank you. Hey, can I just add, Coke Hill is also live streaming theirs next Thursday evening. So. Look at how techie we've all gotten. This is impressive. <laughs> and for, for North Bend, we'll also have a donation hotline where if you really want to contribute, we certainly would, would accept. I thought that was going Very to be nice. the Connor Retirement Fund. No, 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 no. That's, that's, that comes next week. <laughs> Is that a GoFundMe account, Terrence? <laughs> Depending on what happens next week, yeah. <laughs> yes, don't forget. Don't forget to vote. Um, Captain Fabrizio? Did you get a drought declaration from the governor's office? I can't hear you. Oh, well, we, we did get a drought declaration from the governor's office today. So it's official that Coos County is in a drought, which gives water resources some flexibility on, you know, water management issues. And, and you know, you may hear from your constituents about there. There are some water issues, especially up Coos River, that are going to come to a major um, to a major head this year, I would say just because of the shortages and um, and an over allocation on some residential lines so if you get those calls um feel free to you know call or direct them to water resources um kyle hi uh, i haven't had some microphone problems but it looks like it's working great yeah um, so following on the drought thing, we have a meeting next week to see if we're going to be able to support uh, some forest protective work in the three counties. Um, it's not something we've done before, but they reached out and said there was quite a need. Um, so we'd help supplement some of the positions that uh, possibly weren't coming back. Um, the work source centers, we don't have an opening date yet, and they're still trying to figure out what that looks like. I mean, this morning it was bad enough we had to purchase uh, some disposable phones. Uh, the phone lines, we can't even get a line out. Um, and it's the volumes increasing so we know there's you know across the state there's probably 60,000 claims that are still being processed so i think um it's going to keep being an issue we're doing everything we can we'll start taking our contractors quebec's meetings we'll go back to quebec headquarters so that we can meet with job seekers in person um our volunteer matching site is starting to pick up but um any, anybody that needs volunteers to kind of help assist with us getting going again or within their organization we're starting to do the weekly cash drawings for people that have registered and have volunteered it's a 250 dollars prize it will scale up to where there's six uh six prizes weekly in coos county 14 in douglas and six in curry just another way to get some money out into people's hands and they just have to do eight hours of volunteer work um that's in partnership with uh wild rivers and united way um, we have been getting a lot of requests for PP&E still. We had a large shipment of the surgical mask that was, uh, it's been hung up in Korea. We ordered another 20,000 to go over the top of those. And then we are getting an updated tracking number today. 
we still have a lot of the can 95 so we're trying to get them out as fast as we can i know uh john's order for the port uh so our team had, uh reduced the quantity then we did increase that again we do have a lot of the can 95s on, on hand um and on a good note uh our truck driving school that started got at uh, rock and s stables it is taking its first students in CDL training starting Tuesday now. Um, so I think there will be a request for a letter of support that'll go out to some people. Heck just wanted something. So it's not officially a HEC training program. The first two students are done through a workforce board exemption for customized training. And then it will be advertised as a full CDL school here within the next few weeks. And I think that's it on my list. I mean, we um, if there's anything we can do to support anybody through this thing, please just reach out. Thank you. Kyle, that's great news about the truck driving school. Thank you. It's been a problem for a long time. That's wonderful news. Yeah, this one, I mean, it, it, we've been working on it for about a year. There was a, quite a few hurdles, but it's uh, it's great because it accesses the forest network there, uh, connecting with Rock and S, uh, the Rainier land. So it does have a, a log truck focus, but it'll train traditional CDL over the road drivers. Um, so we have, there's been a lot of interest, so we think it'll scale up. And previously, we've been sending everybody out of areas. So this is a cost savings for us as well. Great. All right. Anybody have anything else they want to say before we go? Because we're on schedule. Even a little early, you guys. All right. With that, thank you all so much. This was great. And talk thank to you soon. Thanks, everyone. Yep. Thank you. Take care. Thank you, Melissa. Thank Thanks, you, everybody. Thank you. Have a good weekend.